Greetings. Let's talk for a minute. So, SCA is opening back up. New events are just around the corner. I'll be going to my first uh, in two days this weekend. And with the new restrictions, <clears throat> there's this uh, subject of food at events. Obviously, the hosting groups can't provide it. The SCA can't provide your food right now. Um, there's some limited allowances they're talking about with uh, factory sealed food, but everyone's encouraged to bring their own food right now. Now, this seems like a really timely topic for the moment, but the reality is, is that over the past about 15 years in the society, something's come up that really makes us a little more timeless. So, and that's the matter of providing your own food at an event. Now, I'm never going to tell anyone they can't eat. That's ridiculous. But <clears throat> when we're at an event, one of the things we really want to do is we want to make every effort to try and preserve the medieval ambiance. Uh, now, obviously, we can't do that perfectly. I'm not asking anyone to be a professional theatrical player. But I'm not going to pull any punches. When someone comes in the door to the Great Hall sits down and pulls out uh, a McDonald's bag with a cheeseburger wrapped in a foil wrapper and a paper cup drink, that's not preserving the ambiance. Um, so what I want to do is I want to have a little conversation about how we can provide our own food and we can do it cheaply. A lot of people I've talked with in the past have said, oh, but I don't have the money to do a period, a historical spread. And, there's some fudge room in there and the fact of the matter is you probably do so let's talk about that now first of all I'm going to be approaching this from a very European centric standpoint we're going to be discussing foods analogous to common fare uh, on the European continent um, Spain Germany Italy uh, France England uh, Scandinavia we're going to be talking about some base foods that were more or less found in all of these places this is not going to be true for the rest of the globe um, what foods were common on the Asian continent or the Indian subcontinent, uh, the island of Japan, um, South America. We're learning more every day about the indigenous tribes and the early settlers, pre-European settlers to the South American continent. What, what type of foods were common there? And I'll be honest with you, I don't know. Um, it's not that I'm not interested. <laughs> There's a lot of things to study. I just haven't really gotten into culinary situations with those. So, um... The first thing I want to encourage you to do is uh, do a little bit of reading, a little bit of digging. Online is good, depending on your resources. Um, for where do you play and um, what what were some common foods, what were some common fare there for, especially for people who are traveling. We, we generally like to frame our events as we are people of noble or, or moderately high birth, at least, who are traveling. So... Um, what foods would a traveler bring with them? Now, like I said, I'm approaching this from a European standpoint. So um, we want to keep it simple. Obviously, I don't, I don't want something complicated so that the act of getting the food together is more effort than you're going to get reward from the meal. That's ridiculous. Um, the whole point of a meal is to uh, enjoy it, you know, replenish your resources and, and, and get nourishment out of it. Um, we're going to keep it very simple. Um, what I'm going to propose to you is three parts and we're going to cover, I mean, this, the, the ground roots, you're going to have a grain, we're going to have a protein, we're going to have a dairy, um, and of course a drink. And there's nothing preventing you from uh, adding a fruit to that if you'd like. <clears throat> and we're going to keep this cheap. So my budget right now uh, is $10 or less, and I came in under $10. Um, and the food I got for that $10, I'll point out, will last me more than one day. And that's lunch and dinner. Um, I'm pretty sure this will last me two or three days if I pressed it. Now, breakfast is another story. But if we were to do breakfast, lunch, and dinner off of this, number one, I would be sick of the food. But number two, I would be, um, I'd probably last me about two days, especially if I'm really hungry at the end of the day. So what are we what are we going to do here? Um, I'll be up front. I went to the big box store and bought the cheapest stuff they had, um, but came in at a relatively controlled budget. So let's start off. Um, cheap Gouda cheese. Uh, this was 
three dollars. Uh, I think it was three oh four or something like that. Let's let's say with tax it was four dollars. So we're at four dollars right there. Um, four dollars for cheese. Summer sausage. Um, I think this was four oh five. Let's go off the deep end and say with tax it was five dollars. Five. So we're at four dollars and five dollars. That's nine. And this is a multi-grain loaf, everything French bread. Uh, and this is one dollar. Um, so there's your ten. Uh, and actually, that's that's all rounding up. The cheese may have been two and change, but we came in under ten dollars. <clears throat> and as you can see, there the I've already cut into those, and there's still plenty left. So um, what? How do you do this? First of all, um, cut your bread. I just cut a hunk off the end. I, you don't need to slice it. Sliced bread is, is, depending on where you look, it's not a period of practice. A lot of bread was torn, so just cut a chunk off the end. Um, cheese, very simple. Just slice it. There's no major prep. Does not need to be wafer thin. I did not use a cheese slicer. This is a single knife cut. Um, and the sausage, very much the same. Nice, thick round circles. Now, <clears throat> what do we do with those? Um, me personally, what I will probably do is I will take those whole components before they're cut to the event and I will I will kind of make a little ceremony or, or not ceremony, a little uh, um, tradition as it will of, of prepping it in front of me. That that kind of helps preserve the mood of I am, I am someone who is preparing a historically semi-accurate meal. But, you know, if you're at home, you can pre-cut these, stuff the meat and the cheese together in a bag, stuff, um, stuff the cut of bread in a bag, and then you can put them in a, a travel bag or, um, you know, whatever you want. These, these should all be stable for 12 or 14 hours. You don't need to refrigerate them um, unless, it's, unless it's blisteringly hot. And if it is, you can throw a bunch of ice cubes in a Ziploc bag, put that at the bottom of your container, and that'll help preserve them. These are not things that are going to spoil immediately like, say, milk will. Now, what am I putting these on? Um, I am putting these on a small dessert plate from my personal collection. Um, and it, it doesn't need to be big as you'll see as you can see here the food I mean there's more than enough food on that plate to fill me up but it doesn't need to be a large dinner plate um, and as far as what does the plate need to look like and I know there are people that are going to ask this question so I'll go ahead and answer it a plain white plate is fine we can I mean, porcelain and ceramic plates are period uh, different designs different areas some places used wood some places um, used um, glass was a possibility and so let's just say you don't have one you're comfortable taking to an event you know, you have your kitchen set you don't want to take it out that's fine believe it or not that's excellent because again uh, let's go to the big box store and um, you can buy a plate the same size as mine plain white for 97 cents I just walked by it yesterday so 97 cents um, and let's say you don't have a knife that you want to take to an event. That's that's not unreasonable. People are like, who, who can't send a knife? You know, some people don't want to break up their kitchen set. I'm a little picky about some of my tools. I, some tools I have that I wouldn't take to an event. Um, this is a paring knife. This was 97 cents. That's a real popular number uh, at this particular big box store. Um, and so I did all of the cutting you just saw with this knife. And it came this sharp. I didn't have to prep it or anything. So... Let's assume, let's just assume for a second, go completely off the deep end, that you uh, you don't have anything, all you have is a little bit of cash. So we're at roughly $10 for the food, if that, and that's food for a couple days. We've just added 97 cents plus change, which will be a plus tax, which will be a dollar for your plate, plus 97 cents plus change tax for your um, knife. So you're, you're nine, nine tenths of the way there. Now, I of course have my mug. Speaking of which, um, but you suppose you don't have a mug. That's fine. You can go again the same aisle in the big box store, um, and they have plastic stemware. That it's called shatterproof wine glasses, but it's it's a type of a polyacrylic plastic. 
um, that looks like glass. Oh, good Lord, it looks like glass. And it's 96 cents, 95 cents or something. So now we're at 10, 11, 12, $13. And you've got a plate, a knife, and a glass. Now, what do we want to put in that glass? Okay, this is where I want you to be a little philosophical uh, and have a little bit of fun with this. Um, something, something you're going to notice about the SCA is you spend a lot of time outside. Now, when you're outside, you're going to get tired, you're going to get hot, and you're going to get thirsty. So, there's a lot of alcohol at some events. I'm going to advise you to think about non-alcoholic drinks for starters because if you're that hot and tired and thirsty, you don't need um, you don't need the alcohol. But that doesn't mean you need to give up the ambiance of alcohol. So, uh, again, if you were to look in this glass, you would see a reddish colored liquid. And unless you got your nose right over it, you wouldn't smell anything anyway. So, if I were to pour this into a, a stemware glass, it would look like wine. What is it? It's fruit juice. You think I'm joking? I, I drink this stuff by the gallon. And you can... You can buy uh, two gallons worth of fruit juice mix at that same Big's Box store for $2.30, little packets. Um, and let's have a little bit of fun with it. Suppose, you know, what do you carry this in? You'll notice I was over here fiddling around. Here's my, just ignore the label because I'm recycling it. I'm recycling the bottle. But this is all fruit juice that I mix up. I get a new, I mix up a new one every two days for my home office. So I have something to drink while I'm at work. Um, you notice that when I was talking with you, even while I was talking, I kept my hands down here. You could take one of these to an event. There's some etiquette involved. You know, don't try not to lug this thing out in front of everyone and, you know, make a big presentation of pouring because, again, we want to try and preserve the ambiance. So, you know, just pop the lid kind of off camera, as it were, out of sight, pour a drink. And, and, for, all, and, and for people who want to do it, looking at you do that it could be a pitcher that could be a jug that could be a bottle um something else you could do if you want to spend a little bit of extra money or you have the resources get a bottle of martinelli's sparkling apple cider it's great my wife and i always keep two or three bottles in the house for special occasions because we don't drink but we enjoy um we enjoy something special and i happen to like martinelli's you know take one of those bottles to an event keep it cold when it gets there it should still be coolish depending on what you contain it, what, what the container is um, and then when you're done, keep the bottle. Use that to put your drink in. Then you can put that right on the table and pour it in. Have fun with this. That is that is the critical thing. This is not a chore. This is not, you must do this. You must beat yourself up. to to. You must fight to preserve this ambiance. No. I want you to have fun with this. I want you to take a meal as an opportunity to help add to everyone's ambiance. Do you have a table cover? No. Do you have a dish towel? Uh, maybe you do. You'd be surprised. Some dish towels look great. Just lay them out flat. Put your food right there, and you have a little a little place that you can serve food. Um, you know, you may and, and there are dietary considerations. Of course, people are diabetic, have uh, digestive issues. They can't eat the summer sausage. They can't eat the gouda. That's okay. And believe, I have a lot of friends who have very serious considerations there. What can you eat? You know, what, think about it. Make this a little bit of a mental exercise. What can you bring that you can eat that fits into this envelope of portable and, and some basis in his, history? We know they had loaves of bread. That loaf of bread is not a massive departure from what would be seen in medieval fare. We know they had cheese. We know we have records of tons of cheese being shipped at various points and periods. So cheese is not a stretch in the least. We know they had sausage. We have records of the sausage makers and the meat curers and the salted meats. We know that the preserved meats were a thing early in history. It was part of how armies marched was the ability to transport food like that. So we have that, you know, maybe you require a non-meat diet. Maybe you can't eat bread. Maybe dairy is too rough on your system. Okay, and that's fine. Let's talk. Let's, let's sort this out and let's find something because, like I said, don't treat this as a chore. Consider this an opportunity. Consider this your chance to add to someone else's game because when lunchtime comes at any event, whether it's next week or next year, whether it's at an event that has no food or whether you're waiting four hours before a major feast, 
when you pull out your food, this is your opportunity to add to the ambiance of an event. I'll see you at the next event. God bless.